Hello and welcome to this uh, Project Panama update. I'm kind of happy to be here after four years of the last uh, summit where we uh, kind of kicked off some of the ideas that are going to be discussed in this talk. So the foreign fu function and memory API is really a product of the JVMLS, uh, or at least I'd like to think so. So uh, you know why we are kind of trying to do this, right? Um, Application used to be written in pure Java code. Actually, using native libraries was actively discouraged by some of the uh, some of the most uh, uh, famous uh, uh, Java books. And uh, there are many great uh, libraries today that are not written in Java, and you may want to use them if you want to do some of the most exotic things that you may want to do today. So, if you want to interact with the GPU and you want to offload some of the Java computation off to a GPU, you may want to need uh, to use some native library in there. And I think Gary is going to talk uh, us about that. And code reflection, in, in, in a way, is uh, uh, playing that, 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 that game as well. Uh, but there are also other libraries. So for example, if I want to do some JavaScript, maybe I just want to, to run V8 and run, start running some JavaScript. All those libraries will not be written uh, in Java. So the best thing we can do in Java is to facilitate the way in which developers can get access to such libraries. So how do developers access native libraries today? That's with JNI. So JNI stands for Java Native Interface. Uh, JNI allows you to declare methods that are native methods. These methods are like abstract methods. They don't have an implementation written in Java, but you can implement them in C, C++, or even assembly if you want. The problem, the biggest issue, I think, with JNI is that its programming model is what I call uh, native first. By native first, I, I mean that JNI allows you to basically jump over the fence, go from Java to native, but then it kind of incentivizes you to stay on the native side of the fence. It gives you a lot of JNI functions that you can call in order to interrupt with the JVM. And so, uh, as you can see, a lot of the applications that use JNI typically start using JNI for little things, and then the JNI code becomes bigger and then bigger. JNI also is expensive to maintain and deploy. Typically, it involves creating yet another uh, shared library that contains the implementation for your uh, native methods. And also, it doesn't really have a model for exchanging data to and from Java application. Well, it has a model, but basically, it allows you to pass Java objects to native methods. It doesn't have a way to, for example, pass structs or unions. Uh, it really has to pass pure objects. So this is like the model. Uh, that uh, developers use in order to uh, access a native library with JNI. Uh, on the surface, it's simple, right? You have a Java client, a Java client wants to access a native library, and uh, there is a JNI black box in the middle that is going to do some stuff in order to let you do that. Now, if you zoom into this box, actually, the things uh, that are going on there are quite convoluted. So, for uh, a set of native methods that you may want to have, you also need to generate some header files, and then you need to implement the function in these header files using C, C++, or whatever you. Then you have to compile everything using Clang or GCC, and then you get this shim DLL. So that, that's essentially a library that is not there in order to, that's not the library that you want to call. Your library is the native library. This is just a, a JNI library that is there to allow you to access the native library that you actually wanted to speak to. So it's not easy. And if we translate that into code, you can see how this is not easy in the sense that, I mean, it's not that it's, it's easy, it's, but it's, there's a lot of mechanical code and there's a lot of artifacts that can go out of sync. So if the library under the hood changes, then you need to regenerate the header file, and then you need to tweak maybe your uh, C implementation a little bit, and all these things are very difficult to maintain. And they are a problem to deploy if you are, for example, releasing a Java library that has some native dependencies. So this is an issue. And we haven't even started talking about data, right? Uh, as I said before, JNI has limited option when it comes to passing things to native methods. Uh, native functions more often than not need to interact with some memory, and the memory they need to interact with is OFIP memory. So the Java IC API has an API called byte buffer that allows us to access OFIP memory. And uh, in particular, the direct buffers are byte buffers that are backed by memory that is OFIP. Uh, they can be allocated by Java programs, and the garbage collector will basically free the memory when it's no longer there. Unfortunately, the buffers have some kind of scalability issues. Uh, the allocation, as I said, is 
basically provided by the garbage collector. There is no way for developers to free or unmap a byte buffer. Uh, the addressing space is limited, so we're up to two gigabytes because all the offsets in a byte buffer are int. And the addressing options are kind of limited. So you either go sequential mode, so you call get, 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 and you rely on the mutable state of a byte buffer, and so you get less C2 optimization. Or if you want C2 optimization, you go for the absolute addressing scheme, and uh, then you have to manage all, all your offset manually, which is a little bit of a pain. So of course, you can use uh, a framework to help you Mm, is some of the pains associated with JNI. You can use JNA, JNR, Java CPP. There are many of such frameworks. But these frameworks are not the answer to the problems that we are having. Uh, they provide at most fractured solutions. Most of the time, they rely on unsafe. I never came across a single framework that provided real safe uh, capability to the locate of memory. Uh, and they make deployment even more convoluted. Not only now you have a shim, maybe JNI library, but also you have to depend on a third party framework in order to make interacting with such library a little bit easier. Also, these frameworks are biased toward native access, uh, like accessing native functionality. What if you only care about off-feed memory? There are a lot of frameworks such as uh, uh, Lucene, Netty, data sketches that only need to uh, access off-feed memory and do some work in there to avoid maybe the cost associated with garbage collection. So what we need here is a new programming model, a Java-first programming model, as opposed to the native-first programming model of JNI, that allows us to uh, deal with non-Java resources in a more natural fashion. And to do that, we need to replace JNI and to put in something that allows us to uh, talk to native function in a more direct fashion, without any need of intervening native code. We also want to replace direct buffer with a more modern, future-proof API that allows us not only to access the full 64 bit of addressing space, but also to delocate memory uh, deterministically. We hope that once we have those tools, we can basically bring them together and uh, simplify building and distributing native libraries in Java. So what we came up with is a new Java SE API. It's called Foreign Function and Memory API. This has been a preview API for quite a while now. I think we are at the third preview. And uh, we believe that this API is kind of uh, ready and it will be made a final API in Java 22. So let's get started and uh, let's try to look uh, at what's inside the FFM API. So there are two parts. One part is for accessing off memory. Another part is for accessing foreign functions. So the start of the show when it comes to accessing foreign memory is called memory segment. Memory segment, like a byte buffer, is uh, an abstraction that allows us to access uh, a contiguous region of memory. There are, of course, two kind of memory segments. One uh, is called heap segment, so it's a memory segment that is backed by on heap memory, so memory that stays within the Java heap, so for example, a Java array. And then there is a native segment, so a native segment is backed by off heap memory, so for example, the result of a malloc or a map operation. Uh, memory segments provide a lot of different dimensions by which they provide safety. So they have a size, and if you try to access them out of bounds, you get an exception. But they also have, and that, that's interesting and a novelty here, they have a lifetime. So if you try to access them while they have already been freed or released, you get an exception as well. Also, you can attach confinement uh, to segments, optionally if you want, to avoid data races. So there are all these multiple dimensions of safety that uh, the memory segment API provides. How do you use memory segment? Well, the usage is pretty similar to what you will do with a direct buffer. So let's say that we have a point to this struct in C. This is a, a simple struct with two fields, X and Y of type double. And we want to set uh, the field of this struct to the value three and four. So what do we do? We need to allocate a memory segment and we do that by creating an arena. I'll explain later what an arena is, but for now, let's just pretend that it's something that allows us to create a memory segment of the Java heap. And then we use a bunch of uh, set methods on the memory segment to set uh, the first eight bytes to the value three and the second eight bytes to the, to, to the value four. Pretty much similar to a byte buffer. Now, what happens if we try to access the offset 16? Well, this is out of bounds. Right? If we, we are trying to access uh, eight bytes starting at the offset 16, so that's definitely out of the bound of the memory segment, so we get an exception. So that's good. We get uh, out of bound uh, checks. We get, uh, but, but there are also some issues here. 
we are, we are kind of inheriting some of the same issues that the, the, the Byte Buffer API because we still are relying on the garbage collector to allocate memory. And also, we need to compute all our offsets manually. So, for example, what happens if our point to distract changes and now it has three fields, or maybe the type of one of the field changes? Now all our offsets are going to be messed up and our application will no longer run. So let's see how we can tackle the problem of uh, uh, adding deterministic allocation to the API. So as you probably, I mean, you, are in, you in this room are very familiar with it, Java features automatic deallocation. That means that Java programs can only worry about allocating objects with the new construct. And the garbage collector is busy doing things behind your back and uh, determining which objects are no longer reachable and then recycling the memory for, for such objects. This has been, I think, the main cornerstone of Java success because it suddenly freed developers from having to think about managing memory manually. We tried to use this idea with the byte buffer API. So when you create a byte buffer, the byte buffer is registered against a cleaner so that the garbage collector can determine whether the byte buffer is still used or not. And if it's no longer used, then the memory attached to the byte buffer can be freed. But this approach doesn't always work. The, the, there are three main issues with this. The first is that a small byte buffer instance can, in reality, hold on to a very big chunk of off memory. So the garbage collector doesn't really know this. And it's actually very expensive to tweak all the GC heuristic to have it know this. The second and most important issue is that in order to discover that the byte buffer is no longer used in the first place, we need to materialize what the GC folks call it a reachability graph. A reachability graph materializing it is a very expensive operation, and even more so on the low latency collectors that we have today. So uh, it's an operation that garbage collectors don't want to do as often. And if you try to run byte buffers with uh, the model ZGC, you will notice maybe the cleaners are not going to get called as frequently as with G1. So that's, a, that's an issue. Also, GC only works to keep track of resources that uh, are used inside Java programs. If your byte buffer or memory segment goes off to native, and the native code keeps a pointer and then accesses it later on, there's nothing the garbage collector can do in order to prevent a crash. Of course, you can use reachability fences, but this has some pros and cons. So, we are in the business of adding a mechanism in order to uh, allow developers to deterministically free memory. And of course, here in this business, which is a very messy business, there are plenty of competing solutions. Here I'm basically mentioning the two polar opposites. On one extreme, we have C with its malloc and free primitives. On the other extreme, we have Rust with its machine check memory safety. And uh, of course, from the safety perspective, it's obvious we get a lot better when going from C to Rust. Uh, we, got, we get basically compiler-enforced uh, memory safety. But there is also a flip side to this story. So as we go from C to Rust, what we notice is also that some of the ideons that come natural to C can become a little bit more convoluted to be expressed in Rust. And you have to do a little bit more work to convince the compiler that your program is actually correct. So there is a trade-off here. That's, that's all I'm trying to say. And we have to find a place in this balance that works best for Java developers. So what are the challenges when it comes to explicit memory management? Well, one of the big issues is that uh, when you write realistic application, memory region often depends on each other. So they can have pointers to each other. And then what happens when you start freeing these memory regions? What happens if you free memory regions too early? Well, then you can end up in a situation where you have a dangling pointer, and this is called use after free. And you definitely don't want to do that. The second issue is maybe you forget to free something, and then you get a memory leak. It's not as bad as a use after free, but it's still going to uh, be a detriment to your performance in the long run. Malloc and free is not the right solution for solving these, uh, these problems. In fact, we, we could claim that malloc and free is the very reason as to why we have this problem in the first place. Uh, malloc and free gives a new lifetime to every allocation. So we call it a lifetime soup because an application creates like 47 different memory regions, each with its own lifetime, and there's no way for you to control them in a safe way. Uh, and also malloc doesn't provide any kind of access control. If uh, I, um, a part of the application allocates some memory, a second part of the application that is totally unrelated, if it has access to the pointer, it can free it. So there's no control over this. Rust is a lot safer, but of course it comes with more uh, stuff. You need language changes to support uh, borrowing and ownership. 
And as we said before, some idioms are not so easily expressed. So if you want to implement a binary tree or a list or something like that in Rust, well, there are a lot of uh, gotchas that you have to go through in order to be able to get there. So what we did uh, in the FFM API instead was to resurrect some of the literature that goes uh, back to the 1960s about uh, region-based memory management. So what we did was to introduce an abstraction called ARENA, which uh, manages the life cycle of one or more memory segments. All the segments that are located inside an ARENA share the same lifetime. And this is a very good property because it means that since they have the same lifetime, they can exchange pointers in a completely safe manner. There are many different kinds of arenas provided by the FFM API. There are arenas that are basically for which memory never goes away. This is called the global arena. There are arenas that are managed automatically by the garbage collector. That, wa that was the arena that we used before in, in our previous example. So that kind of gives us a behavior that is similar to byte buffers. But then we have explicit arenas that you can close uh, manually. So you can call the close method on the arena and get rid of the memory. And we have two flavors of them. One is the confined arena that is basically an explicit arena that uh, give you single threaded access. And we have a shared arena that is kind of the same, but with access from multiple threads. No matter which arena you, you choose, you always get strong temporal uh, guarantees. So it's never possible for you to access a memory segment after its memory has gone away. And that happens even if you're trying to access a shared segment that is going to be closed concurrently by another thread. In order to do this, of course, we had to do, to, to, to do a lot of uh, work under the hood. Uh, in particular, when you close a shared arena, there is a thread local and shake that is going to be initiated in order to make sure that no thread in the VM, no uh, platform thread, is accessing any memory segment that is associated with the arena being closed. Clients can also define custom arenas, which is useful to define custom allocators. So that's another uh, avenue that is uh, useful and beneficial to Java developers. So our claim here is that Java kind of sits in this happy middle between the uh, flexi flexibility but unsafety of C and the uh, uh, safety but slight unflexibility of Rust. So how do we use confined arenas in our code? The only thing we need to change here is really how we allocate our segment. Instead of using the automatic arena, we are going to use a confined arena now, and we are going to use it inside a try with resource. That's the other big change. This means that the memory is going to remain valid inside the try with resource block, but after the try with resource block is closed, the memory will disappear. There's no need to wait around for the garbage collector. There's no need to wait for the cleaner to be invoked. It will just happen as you close the brace. And what happens if you leak the memory segment from inside the try with resource block to the outside? Well, if you try to access it outside the try with resource block, you'll get an exception. So the FFM API will check temporal safety as well as spatial safety. So that's a lot better. Uh, now we have deterministic allocation, we have uh, spatial and temporal safety. We still have the niggly issue about the offsets that we have to specify manually. So what can we do about that? Well, our solution to the problem is to come up with an, an API to describe uh, the layout of a region of memory. So we have a memory layout API. With this, we can describe, for example, what is uh, the layout of this point to distracts that in, in the previous example has uh, only been a comment in our code. So now we can actually create an object, uh, a layout object, that is a struct layout that has two fields with name X and Y. These fields are Java double, they are value layouts, and uh, they allow us to, to access the data that is associated with this field. Once we have a layout object, we can query the object for uh, uh, understanding, for example, what is the size of the struct or what is the offset to some of the struct fields. So that's very powerful. A value layout, if you notice uh, the previous example, is passed as a parameter in all the access expression. And that's because a value layout uh, incarnates all the different access coordinates that we need when we need to the reference memory. So it has a carrier type, so it, it knows which Java types it need to use when reading and writing memory. It also has an associated endianness, so it knows whether to apply byte swapping operation when reading things that are multi-bytes. But it also has alignment constraints. So when reading a Java double, we can decide whether to use a value layout that is eight byte aligned, which is the norm for doubles, or use an unaligned layout, which allows us to access unaligned doubles. 
So all these come together in a value layout. And that means that if we have a value layout, we can also create our handles. Our handle that allows us to access a memory segment at a certain offset and then get back some Java values, maybe some Java primitives. Expressing access in terms of memory, uh, sorry, in terms of Varendos has many advantages. Of course, we can inherit all the C2 optimization that Varendos already enjoys. We can uh, also enjoy of the various atomic access operations that are built into Varendos. So thanks, Paul. That was really handy. And uh, we can also uh, build combinator APIs. So once you have a Varendo that accesses a memory segment, you can maybe insert uh, offsets or you can combine it with other Varendos and uh, build structure access in that form. So here's how you use the method, uh, the, the, the memory layout API in order to uh, access memory without uh, uh, having manual offset computation. As you can see in the first lines of this uh, code, you can see that we are trying to capture the comment now in a real Java object. This is a memory layout. This layout has two fields, so we can uh, derive a variable for each of the fields, X and Y. And so inside our try with resources, now there are two big differences. The first is that we are passing the layout to the allocate method. So no longer we need to compute the size of the struct by end. We just pass the layout, and the layout is going to give us the size. The second difference is that we are going to use variables in order to access the fields. And so we, don't, we no longer have to know that the Y field occurs at an, at an 8 byte offset. The variable will know that. And so the offset that you see here, which is 0, is simply the offset relative to the start of the struct. So in case we want to access multiple points in an array. So finally, we have deterministic delocation, we have spatial, uh, spatial safety, we have temporal safety, and we no longer have manually computed offsets. So I think this is much better than uh, using the by buffer API, at least for interacting with off-heap memory. So now it's time to switch gears and start talking about the foreign uh, function access part of the FFM API. The start of the show here is called the native linker. The native linker is a component that allows us to uh, get a method handle that points to a native function. And also it provides the dual capability, which is uh, given uh, some Java computation, expresses a method handle, turn it into a function pointer that then we can pass to native code. The native linker is not something that we just uh, reinvent from scratch, but it's just something that is built on top of the abstraction that we have seen so far. So it will use memory layouts to describe C signature. It will use memory segments to pass structs and unions to native code. And it will use arenas to model the life cycle of some of the abstraction involved, such as the opcode stubs. So let's enhance our example a little bit and introduce a distance function that takes, this distance function takes a point and then returns the distance uh, from the origin of that particular point. So here we are passing a struct by value, and maybe some of you know that the passing a struct by value is highly dependent on the uh, calling convention of the platform you're running on. So if you are on Linux, uh, there is a document that I encourage you to read. It's a very nice uh, a document about the CSV ABI, which is basically in, embodies all the set of calling conventions that you should use when interacting with shared libraries in C on that particular platform. And uh, if you read, you will see that uh, for such small structs, we can simply pass the struct fields by register. So we can, uh, in this case, we are using floating point register because the fields are of type double. And then we can basically store them in register and then jump to the function. But if we are on Windows, always on x64, there is a lot of difference here. Uh, basically, on Windows, the, the struct is spilled on the stack, then a pointer to the stack is uh, saved on the RCX register, and then we can jump to the function. So same platform, same architecture, but different operating system, completely different uh, assembly being generated. So I'm trying to show you this, not because you have to understand assembly, not even I do uh, to, to some extent, but just to show you that uh, the linker has to have intimate knowledge about uh, the assembly code that needs to generate in order to allow you to, to, to get a good trampoline to that native function that you want to call. So how do you create a down call method handle? You need two ingredients. The first is the address of the function that you want to call. That may seem a little bit obvious. The second is the function descriptor. The function descriptor is a description in Java of the signature of the C function that you want to call. 
This description is going to be platform dependent and it's going to contain a lot of layouts. It's going to contain a layout for the retort type, it's going to contain a lot of layouts for the parameter types. And from these layouts, you can derive a Java method type that is the type of the method handle that you're going to get. So let's see quickly how you can use the linker API. So let's say that we want to call this distance function. So we use a symbol lookup, we'll talk about that a little bit later, to retrieve the address of the distance function. Then we describe the signature of the distance function using a function descriptor. In this case, we return a Java double and we take a point to D as an argument. Notice here that we are using the same struct layout that we defined to access memory. So we reuse the same information both for accessing memory but also to describe the signature of the C function. Then inside our try with resources, we allocate our point, we set X and Y, and then we just pass our point method segment, memory segment to the invoke exact method. And the native call will happen. There's no intervening JNI code that is required here. It's pure Java code. And performance is good too. So this is big thanks to Yorn, who's been our kind of compiler guru and this sort of thing. And uh, you can see that basically JNI and FFMI trade uh, on the same line. There is a 0 0.3 nanosecond difference between the two, but it's not going to be relevant. It's probably be benchmark noisier. One thing that you can do with FFMI API is that you can mark the native call as being trivial. By trivial, I mean that it's going to be, uh, it's going to terminate quickly and not going to up call back to Java, in which case we can remove, uh, we can uh, shave away another few nanoseconds from the call by removing this thread state transition from the call, which is very expensive. This can be useful for low latency Java code and it's uh, known in JNI world as critical JNI, that you may know with the, the term from there. So we have an abstraction to look up symbols in native library that's called symbol lookup. There are many kinds of symbol lookups provided by the FFM API. For example, if you are loading your library using system load library, you can get a loader lookup that allows you to look inside those library and get the address of symbols there. Or you can, if you want to know the address of some standard library symbol from C, you can ask the linker for a default lookup and that will give you a symbol lookup for that. But we also have a library lookup, which is a more powerful lookup that is built on top of DL open and DL close. So you can now deterministically load and unload a library and you will use an arena to do that. You can of course compose lookups, so you can start off with a loader lookup and maybe if the symbol is not found there, you will go on to use another lookup using the OR method there. As we said before, uh, describing the signature of a C function is done using layout. So there is a mapping. For every C type, there is a corresponding layout that you should use. So for a scalar type, you're going to use a value layout. For pointer types, you're going to use an address layout. For struct and union types, you're going to use a composite layout, which we call group layout. There are a lot of platform dependent details in this layout. So for example, if you take the sites underscore T type, this type is going to be 32 bits on 32 bit machine, but 64 bit on 64 bit machine. So developers will have to be wary about those dis distinctions. And also the padding inside structs is going to vary as well. The linker expose uh, a nice helper function that gives us uh, a way to discover what are the layouts associated to commonly used C types. So we can get this canonical layout map and ask, for example, what is the layout associated with size underscore T? And then we will get back a, either a Java int layout or a long layout, depending on which platform you know, we are on. One important topic when it comes to down calls is that of external allocation. And we actually spent quite a lot of time designing this API to try to make sure that we got this absolutely right. So a very common idiom in C APIs is, is that Memory allocation doesn't happen in the client code, but it actually happens in the library. So I, I can exemplify that in the slide by having a pair of method, make point and free point. Make point is basically just doing a malloc and returning a pointer to the region of memory that has been allocated. And then free point is taking the pointer and just freeing it. The only thing that changes for the client is that instead of allocating the struct on the stack, you will just have to call this pair of functions in order to get access to the region of memory. So how do we model this code using FFM API? One of the challenges here is that Java doesn't know anything about the memory regions that are returned by native code. It doesn't know how big they are. It doesn't know what is their lifetime, if they have confinement at all. 
So what FFM API does, it returns what we call zero length memory segment. So it returns us like a shim memory segment that has the right base address, but it has zero size, which means that if you try to get the contents of the memory se segment, you will get an error because the segment has zero size, so you can't access it. The segment is also always alive, so if you want to pass it opaquely to other function, which is a common idiom in C, you can do so, and you don't need to do anything. But what if you want to dereference the memory inside one of these weird segments? Well, the API allows you to override both the spatial and temporal bounds associated with the segment. And that, is, that operation is called memory segment reinterpret. So this is how you do it. Let, let's assume that we have a bunch of them called method handle for make point and free point. Then inside our try with resources, we are going to first call make point, and we are going to get a zero length memory segment. But then we want to reinterpret it and say, well, I actually want to say that the size of the memory segment is the size of the point to distract. So I'm going to pass the layout to the operation. And then I'm going to further say that the lifetime of this memory segment is the lifetime of the arena that I'm using. And I'm also providing a cleanup action. So when the arena is going to be closed, I want this segment to call the free point method handle. After this point, this memory segment is like any other memory segment that has been created using Java code through the memory, the, the, the memory segment API. There's nothing to distinguish it. If we try to access it out of bound, we get an exception. If we try to access it out of the tribe with resources, we will also get an exception. But of course, with power comes responsibility. What happens if, for example, I reinterpret my segment and I give it a weird size? I say that the size of the segment is actually 200 bytes. Well, that's that's unfortunate because now I can try to access the segment at offset 100 and FFM API will happily oblige because it knows that the segment is 200 bytes so I can just access it, right? And if we try to do this, well, we just get a VM crash. Too bad. But if you look at the lines before the crash, the FFM API is still trying to tell us something. It tells us that a restricted method in the memory segment class has been called. This, this, this method is called reinterpret. And we should use an enable native access uh, command line in order to avoid this warning. What is this fuss about? So basically, we know that interacting with native code is, of course, unsafe. We can make it 100% safe. We can make certain things 100% safe. So if you access off your memory with FFM API, you are totally safe. But when it comes to interacting with native function, you're always going to be unsafe, whether because your segment resizing is going to be wrong, or maybe you are going to give the wrong description of the C signature, your native call may fail. So we decided to tackle this add-on by defining a subset of methods in the FFM API that are called restricted methods. These methods are part of the Java C API, but they come with extra labels. If you try to use them, you're going to get warnings. And if you, got to, if you want to get rid of the warnings, you have to use a command line option in order to tell which modules in your application have access to this low-level native operation. This is the first step towards a safer Java and native interop. FFM API is just the first step. JNI is likely going to follow. And the first step is probably going to restrict system load library. This is essentially, uh, this completes the integrity by default push, which started with Java 9. You remember all the talk about strong encapsulation. Uh, native code was still an issue in the topic because it was possible for native code to still crash your application in some weird ways. Restricted methods allows us to model the way in which your application is going to be unsafe and then let the developer choose whether they want that or not. So of course you can also do the opposite. So you can call Java code from native and you can do so with an upcalls tab. To create an upcalls tab, you need a method handle, which captures the computation that you want to express. You need a function descriptor, which expresses the, the, the signature of the, C, the, the function pointer that you want to, to run. And then an arena, which describes the lifetime of this upcalls tab. This is especially useful when interacting with C function like QSort, which takes us some kind of upcall that does some custom stuff. So in this example, QSort is accepting a function pointer to sort the contents of, a, of an array. We can uh, actually uh, use QSort from FFM API code entirely in Java. So what we need to do, it requires a, a bunch of setup code, but uh, hopefully it's kind of simple. 
First, we need to declare some function that compares two pointers in a class. Then we need to create a function descriptor that describes the signature of the function pointer that we are about to create. This function pointer is going to take two addresses and it's going to return an int. Then we are going to create a method handle to the function that we just defined. And then we are passing all these to the linker. The linker is going to give me back a memory segment, which is essentially a function pointer. And I can pass it to native code. So here's how I use it. Basically, I have a try with resource. I create a memory segment, which is an array of the Java heap. I pass this array to the QSort method handle. And I also pass the int comparator memory segment to the, to, to, to the QSort method handle. This is the function pointer that sorts the contents of the array. And what, what I get back is the array sorted. And I can map it back to Java if I want. Perf uh, so as you can see, this is still 100% Java code, so that's good. There's a lot of setup code involved. We have to create method handles, we have to create function descriptors. It would be nice to kind of simplify that, and we'll see how to get that later. Performance-wise, this is very good. Yarn has baked a lot of optimization into the Panama code, so that basically FFA API is almost three times as fast as the NI code doing the app code. So that's good. 100% Java code, but it's still faster. So how do we want to go about resolving the problem of uh, eliminating all this setup code that we need for FFM? So let, let's take a step back and see how far we got. So we still have our Java client that wants to reach a native library, and we have some FFM API stuff in the middle. If we look inside, we actually did some improvement here because all the goop that we require here is full Java code. So we require a bunch of memory layouts, a bunch of bar handles, a bunch of function descriptor, maybe method handles, but it's all stuff that we can express in Java code. We don't need any shim DLL in order to do any of this stuff. So this is already going to simplify deployment. But what if we could short circuit the process and actually derive all this goop from the native library itself? And that's where the JXtract tool come into life. So basically, if we want to work with QSort, a better way to do it is just to point JSTract at the QSort uh, header, which is the header for the standard library. JSTract will happily oblige, will vomit a bunch of code. And uh, inside this code, there will be a class called stdlib underscore h, which contains a, a bunch of static, library, uh, static methods that we can use in order to write this code more simply. One such function allows us to turn a lambda expression into a function pointer. How cool is that? And then we also have uh, ND wrappers uh, around uh, the down call method handle. So we don't have to interact with method handles directly. We just call QSort, and QSort is going to be a static method that just calls the, the, the method handle, as you can imagine. So this is still 100% Java code, but there is no setup code required because basically the setup code has been generated by J the JSRAC tool. So wrapping up, uh, FFM API provides a good uh, memory uh, unit that allows us to do deterministic allocation. It allows us to access the full 64-bit addressing space. And also, it uses a layout API to provide structure access. It also provides uh, a more direct way to call native function. We no longer need to create shim libraries or jump throughs in order to call native code. We can just get a method handle and just call it. And together, these two bricks come into life because we can actually use them to create tools that can generate the bindings automatically from a native library header. But the tools of JSTract is not, not the only goal here. In reality, what we discover is that FFM API is actually very powerful when it comes to defining uh, frameworks that let uh, JVM languages, so languages built on top of the JVM, access native libraries. So there's already a bunch of them for Scala and Clojure, and maybe we hope that Kotlin is going to follow soon. So there's a bunch of framework that allows these languages to access native libraries through FFM API. And that's particularly convenient because FFM API is low level enough, being expressed only in method handles, that doesn't introduce any unnecessary bias to, the, to, to those languages. So that's good. We have been previewing and incubating the API pretty aggressively. Our motto was trying to get out sooner rather than later so we can get more feedback and bake it into the API. As a result of that, we had quite a lot of adoption of the API. So Netty, Lucene, and Tomcat, uh, they have uh, branches where they implement their logic using FFM API. And I think 
for Lucene and Tomcat, if you use them against JDK 21, we are actually running code that uses FFM API today. There is also a lot of other projects like Tornado VM, I think we're going to see maybe today that is going to use some memory segment in order to access GPU memory. That's very cool. Data Sketches is also looking into, into this. And also we have other projects like InfiniLeap that is using both the Linker API and memory segment in, in order to, to have better IO performances with Java. This is only the beginning of the story. If we want to make Java a more relevant language for machine learning, we need to do a lot more. I'm not going to list all the things in the slide, but at the very least, we need Valhalla to give us more primitive types. We want half floats, we want complex types, we want unsigned types, all these things that Java developers have been wanting for a long time. We need Valhalla to, to be able to do this. And maybe, since we are using barendos and metadendos quite a lot, startup is going to be, become an issue, I believe. And so maybe shifting the computation for this down call method end of from runtime to link time is going to improve the story there. So I encourage you to download JDK 21 and play with it. Uh, now is an ideal time to try FFM API and to report some feedback in the Panama mailing list. As I said before, we are preparing to finalize the API in Java 22. There are some links to the various JEPs. JExtract is made available as a standalone downloadable tool. So you can just go on that jdkjava.net page, download JExtract, and try it out. You don't need to do any complex building or setup. And that's it for me. I think we have not much time for questions because we have some issues. <laughs> Maybe one or two. Yeah. Uh, so I played with the uh, memory API quite a bit, and it's really powerful to be able to m manipulate raw memory and like build custom structures into it. But what I found is that when I tried to build libraries on top of it, I quickly ran into the problem that if the callers were mixing off heap memory and on heap like byte arrays, you'd get profile pollution and the performance would be as bad as using a raw byte buffer. Have you put any thought into like having the memory segment API be able to have single code that operates on both on heap and off heap yeah. without suffering from the pollution? Yeah. yeah, right now we have to do the usual thing, which is defining different subclasses, which runs into the problem that you you just mentioned. With John, we were we were uh, uh, looking into alternatives for implementing these a little bit more directly and have a monomorphic implementation and deal with both. And I think it's possible, but it requires the Valhalla story to be there. And we require, uh, one, one thing that is missing is field uh, uh, profiling of information. So we need to basically put the information as to whether the segment is of heap or on heap into some data structure in a field of the memory segment. And unfortunately, the VM is not able to speculate on that field. And that is kind of what's blocking performances. But we believe that at some point we will be able to get there and solve that issue as well. Hey, let me so currently, uh, um, there is no way to use uh, the memory segment with the IO API. With the IO? Yes. You can. Uh, you can always map a segment to a byte buffer, which uh, basically gives you a byte buffer, and then you can use whatever uh, method you want there. Yes. Yeah, but That's. is there a plan to have a direct? Uh, is there a plan to have direct uh, support for memory segment there? Uh, there have been discussion, uh, nothing concrete yet. Two quick questions, uh, both of which I think are possible. Can you pass a confined arena outside of a tribal resources block? Yes. Uh, well, well, wait. Uh, if the block has been closed, uh, you can pass it, but then when you try to access the segment, you're going to get an exception. No, I'm saying you create the uh, confined uh, arena. Yeah but not inside of a TWR. Okay, yeah, you can definitely do that, yes. And then yeah. pass, they even yeah. pass it to another function yes, that yes, does yes. the closure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that was actually one of, 
This is why this API took so long, because at the beginning we were convinced that, oh yeah, all the access happens inside a bubble. That's not true for many of the frameworks that are out there. Right. So we needed to kind of <laughs> rethink the, the whole story a little bit. And the other question was, uh, can you uh, reinterpret in stages? Yes, you can, you can first give a size, and then when you're ready, you can give it a lifetime or, yeah, or, or in any order size. you want. Yes, a larger size after okay. that, yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you very much.